Hello everybody, Nefertiti here. Alright, so before this video gets started, I just wanted to kind of explain a little bit about what I'm going to be doing. So for those who do know, recently I joined TikTok because I just, I was bored and felt like checking it out because every so often I'll see a cute video pop up and I figured I'd check it out. Upon joining, one of the first things I saw is that a lot of newer furries have been using these raptor masks from Target to make sort of starter fursuits. I personally think this is amazing. Like, I know there's a lot of discussion about whether or not these are fursuits. Not by themselves, but with a little bit of hard work, you can easily turn them into one. And they've even got moving jaws on them, so decent enough vision that you can see. So it's pretty cool. And I would just, I love seeing all the creativity that people have for designing them and creating their own custom characters out of them. So that being said, I thought it would be fun to try my own hand at creating a custom character with one. So I designed this character that you see on screen now. I had a lot of fun picking a color palette to play around with and initially I was going to go for very dark browns instead of black, but I felt like the black just had this really nice ashy color to it and I think it'll help blend all these tones in there with the bright reds and yellows. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And throughout the process of me making this, I do want to use it as sort of a tutorial for anybody out there who's looking to customize their own one of these things. I'm going to give general helpful tips to how you can make yours look better as well as make it look unique and just customize it so that it is special to you. And I feel like this is just going to be a fun video overall. So if you're interested in checking it out, I'll have a whole series on it. They're probably going to be a bit longer videos since there's a lot of labor involved with making something customized. But if that's something you're interested in and you want to learn about it, then stay tuned and we're going to do all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> but with that, I think I've done enough of my rambling and introductions, so uh, why don't we go ahead and just jump right into the customization process. Okie dokie. So the very first thing we're going to go over are our materials. And of course, you're going to need one of the raptor masks. I got mine from Target, but I know you can get them online as well for a bit more expensive price. You will also need a high temperature hot glue gun. And I personally prefer using the Gorilla Glue brand as they work phenomenally well and they are super duper strong. You will also need two types of scissors, one for specifically fabric and only fabric and the other for mixed media and paper and all sorts of other things. You will need two markers, a dark one and a light one if you're working more so with dark fabric, a small screwdriver, and two types of elastic, one being one inch wide and the other being two inches wide. These will be very helpful later on. And of course, you'll need a fabric ruler so that you can measure all kinds of dimensions that you need. You also need two kinds of foam. One is only one millimeter thick for small details and the other is three millimeters thick. This works really good for doing eyes and other parts, but we'll get into that a little bit later. You also need two kinds of foam. I have half inch foam here and one inch foam right here that I've recycled from other projects. All right, so with these Raptor masks, they sort of come with like this weird latex or plasticky kind of piece here that's designed to hold your face, as well as this really cheap elastic that doesn't do a very good job, especially if you have an adult sized head like I do. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is actually remove these. There are four little screws in here that you'll need to take out if you want to remove this piece. Now this part is optional, but I find it makes the whole project end up looking a lot better and being a lot more comfortable in the end. Once you have the screws removed, simply wiggle this little piece out until it pops out of the four little sockets that are holding it. You'll now see that there are these four really annoying little pegs sticking out. It's up to you if you want to keep these, but I personally want to cut mine off so that I have that nice and flush. So I just took some pliers and snipped them right off. And with them done, now it's time to get the elastic off. Just slide a pair of scissors into the little holes and cut them out. As well as this chin strap on the bottom, which we'll be replacing with something a lot better. It's pretty easy to get off and then just takes a little bit of refining if you want to sand these edges flush so that they're not all sharp. After a little bit of sanding, this is roughly what I have. 
Now bear in mind, this part is totally optional, but it did work really good for me and it made the mask very comfortable. Now it's time to measure for the actual piece of the head and how it's going to be held on. Place the mask on your face in a position that's comfortable and take your fabric ruler from one side and measure to the other side of the hole. You don't want this to be super tight. You just want it to be loose enough that it covers the edges. Once you do, you're gonna glue it down to the inside of the mask. But first, take a sharp pair of scissors or an X-Acto knife, and please be careful with them, and just scratch up the area where you're going to glue the edge of the elastic down. This helps give the glue a lot more tooth to grab onto and makes it super duper strong when it dries. Once that's done, just apply a little daub of hot glue that covers about an inch worth of your elastic. When you cut it, take this into account. This helps it get a nice big area to grab onto and minimizes the chances that this can be pulled off very easily. Wait for the glue to dry, and of course, attach the other side, making sure that you did flip it so that it sits nice and flush against your head and isn't all twisted up. Once that's done, go ahead and do a test fit. An important thing to note is that when you're actually attaching the straps, make sure that they angle slightly down and go across the top of your ear rather than just going straight back. This will help it hold on to the mask significantly better as it'll grab the back of your head. Now we need to add a top strap for added support. Scratch up the surface again so that the glue has something to grab onto and it makes the elastic hold on much tighter. As before, make sure you have a nice one inch overlap and place your elastic on top. Now, bear in mind, I used the two inch elastic for the wrapping around the back of my head, but only the one inch for the top of the head. I find this does make a big difference, especially if your mask tends to be on the bit heavier side. The two inch just helps to grab the edges a lot better. Place the mask back over your face. And as soon as you've got it in a position that you're happy with, and it feels good, looks good, and your vision isn't blocked, Take the elastic over the top of your head and don't stretch it. It should just loosely sit on top of your head. Measure until you feel the back of it and then cut the end so that it just barely lays over the top. We then need to glue it in place, simply like the others. Apply enough glue to cover the overlap. Find the center point of the back elastic. Lay it down and let it all settle into place taking care not to get hot glue on your fingers. Trust me, I've burned mine way too many times doing this. <laughs> Once that strap is all attached, it's now time to do the chin piece, which is the most vital part if you want to keep that moving jaw intact. Take that three millimeter foam we've got earlier and just trace around the inside shape of the jaw, making sure that you go just about to where the hinge is. Cut this out using your other scissors. And when I did this, I did leave an itty bit of an edge on it because I know that I'm gonna need a little bit of extra space when I glue it down. So this is something to keep in mind. Just make sure you have maybe a fourth of an inch of a little edge piece. Test it and make sure that it does line up where it's supposed to and then we're going to actually glue it on the inside of the mask. This will help it hang on much better and prevent it from falling out. It also makes it look nice and flush, which is a bonus. I marked the edges of the mask here where the piece lined up so that I know how far to put the glue, and then I just have to figure out how to angle my hot glue gun to get inside this mask. It's a lot smaller than working with DVC bases, so it was rather difficult to get my big glue gun in there, but you live and learn, and I did manage to do it overall. Lay a pretty good amount of glue in there, and then just stick the little chin piece in. Slide it into the place where it needs to go, making sure that it lines up with your little doodle marks on the edges. And then just press and hold it in place until it dries. Once that piece is finally dry, you're going to use a tool like this. Now this is a heat gun, and this part is optional. You can use a hair dryer with this kind of foam. The heat gun just makes it easier. Heat up the foam somewhat 
but not too, too much because you don't wanna melt the hot glue. Just keep it on the low setting, heat it up a little bit. And then once it's not super hot, use your chin in order to mold it to the bottom of your face. You wanna do this with your jaw closed and make sure that you just stretch it to go right underneath the bottom of your chin. We're sort of building a little chin cup for your jaw to sit in when you're working on this. You can see how it billows out there at the end and it actually did pop the edges off here. So I went in with my hot glue gun and I tacked them back down. This does happen sometimes and it is kind of frustrating, but it's not intolerable. While I was at it, I also added a big layer of glue right along the edge here, just for some added support, just to make sure this piece doesn't fall off. Since this is gonna be under a lot of stress with me opening and closing the jaw all the time, it's very good to make sure that that's gonna stay solid. Once it's dry, we can move into the rest of this, which if you're like me, I have a very small head. Got a big forehead, but I got a small head. So I have to pad out the top of this mask, otherwise it's just gonna be way too painful for me to wear it. Make a nice semicircle like this and just wedge it right up in there. You may have to add a small little piece right here in order to pad out your forehead if you have a very sharply sloping forehead like I do. Best thing to do is just test fit everything and see how it works. Try it on your face again and again and again just to make sure everything fits right. And when it does, nom, 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 nom. Bond, it sits on my face nicely, but it did need a little bit more of a patch right here at the front. So once I glued this piece down, I did have to come in and alter this. Now, I chose to leave this portion of the footage in just so that I could take a minute to talk to you guys about why this is necessary. Now, if you're a smaller person or even a child, these masks fit perfectly on small kids. They are very, very small in comparison to masks that are built for adults. Because I'm an adult, it doesn't quite fit me the same way it does. This is why I have to do all this extra padding and I have to move the jaw strap around. I have a fairly small head, but even still, I had to fiddle around with this, trim the edges, add extra padding, and do all sorts of stuff just to make this thing fit comfortably and still have the moving jaw function. Always test fit things before you glue them down because peeling the glue up is a pain in the butt, trust me. The next thing I'm gonna do is just take a piece of that little one millimeter foam and we're just going to lightly glue this down over top of that piece of foam on there that I stuck down with the white foam that's much squishier. The only reason I'm doing this is because it acts like a sweat guard. Granted, I always wear a balaclava with masks like these, but adding this little piece of foam right here helps to decrease the amount of sweat that can get trapped in the foam, and thus it will increase the longevity of the mask. Ta-da! Look at that moving jaw. So neat. It did need a little bit more work right here in the nose bridge so it would stay up on my face correctly, so I went ahead and modified that as well off camera. The next thing we're going to do is actually work on making the 3D follow me eyes. Now, in order to do this, the first thing you need to do is actually figure out what the interior of the eye looks like. So take a scrap piece of paper, press it up against the inside of the eye like this, and then just trace around the edge of it with a Sharpie or something. This will give you the general shape of your eye. So now you can draw the pupil, the iris, whatever. An important thing to note is if you really want an effective follow me eye, make sure that you draw the iris and pupil in the center of this eye mold that you're doing. Now, Unfortunately, this next part of my footage ended up getting corrupted. I'm not sure why, but when it got corrupted, I lost all the footage. So if you want a good follow me eye tutorial, there'll be one up in the corner of the screen or I'll link to one in the description. Once you get your eyes done and installed, it's important to put a primer down for the paint. I prefer to use acrylic gesso as it does work really well, but it's also thin enough that it doesn't interfere too, too much with the actual mask. Now, you can see here that I do have the eyes already installed on my mask. As I said, I lost the footage, it got corrupted, and it's irritating because I spent hours recording it, but 
it happened the way it did, I'll include a link to a really good Follow Me Eye tutorial if you guys want to learn how to do that. Or eventually I'll just make another one in the future. I also used Epoxy Sculpt to build custom scales around the eyes because I wanted my mask to have a very unique silhouette all by itself. So this is totally optional. I chose to do it and it really did come out cool and I liked the way it looked. So things that you can do is just play around and modify stuff. I also get a lot of people asking me what the eyes are made of on my mask and they are made of a material called buckram which you can see out of fairly well, but it's very difficult for others to see into it. So it works really well to give this illusion that this is a character or a creature rather than a person wearing a mask. Now this next portion of painting took a very long time, so I will try to save you guys the hours of putting down the primer, but it did end up taking two base coats of primer in order to get to the level of opacity that I needed. It's very important that when you're using a primer on plastic like this, try to get something that's fairly watered down because you don't want it to be super thick. There's this lovely sculpted scale texture all over these raptor masks. And the thing about them is if you use too heavy of a paint, like straight acrylics right out of the tube, it will actually eat those beautiful sculpted details and bury them in the paint. If you put down the primer like this first, especially using gesso that's very thin, it helps to preserve that texture while still giving your acrylic paint for later on something to grab onto. I highly recommend using gesso whenever you're trying to put down a primer. I suppose you could always just mask off the eyes and take it outside and Plasti Dip it, which works just as well. But Plasti Dip is prone to peeling, whereas gesso is more of a permanent solution. So all in all, just take your time and paint it layer by layer by layer until eventually you end with this. So this is the base coat with the gesso on, and then I added my actual base coat of acrylic paint, which was an ivory white color. And now I'm doing a slight little blend here with a technique that's called dry brushing, which is where you have a pretty dry paintbrush, you brush on a slightly darker color than what you're working with, and then you take a dry paper towel and you wipe away most of it. It will leave the darker color inside the cracks, but it will still keep the brighter, lighter color on top. So it gives it much more dimension and makes it look much more three-dimensional and just more alive, I think, is the best way to describe it. I started by using like a softer blue here to blend these colors out. Ultimately, I did go back and I changed it to more of like a slightly red undertone because I ended up with so many red colors that I wanted something a little bit brighter. I felt like the blue was too soft of a tone. So once I did that, then I came in and did the lips which for this particular character, I wanted her to have really thick black gums and lips. I just felt like it was a much better blend than what I was doing. You'll also notice that I do kind of paint over top of the teeth here. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I haven't actually painted the teeth yet. All they have is just their base coat of gesso on there. So I'm gonna go over them again with a white pearl color that will really make them look like bone teeth. It's important to get in all those little nooks and crannies. It'll really help the whole mask look much more alive. And now, with the red stripe painted on here, I'm going to show you how you get really smooth blends. It's similar to the dry brushing technique, except you water your paint down a lot and you dab it on like this on the edges, just trying to create as smooth of a transition as you possibly can as you're working on it. Once you get to a certain level, you then take your dry paper towel and just lightly dab along the edges and blend it in a little bit. You can always add just a smidge of water if you need to kind of smooth it out a little more. This will push and pull the values of the paint until eventually you start getting a nice clean edge. You can also see I kind of got a little bit of paint dribble at the bottom. Don't worry about that. It'll be covered up anyway by the fabric that I put down. It was just kind of funny to see that little one got away from me at the bottom. <laughs> See? Fixed it. We're all good. 
and now we have that nice smooth transition between the red and white. Once you finish all your painting, you do want to take your head outside and seal it with something before you do this step here. Unfortunately, again, lost the footage because my camera hates me, but I use a matte Mod Podge spray and I usually give it eh, anywhere between one and two coats depending on how thick the paint is. I believe this mask took two coats of paint, or excuse me, two coats of sealant in order to protect it. This just keeps your paint from flaking or scratching off and it also slightly waterproofs it. Once you do have it all painted and sealed and ready to go, you can then put it on a little mannequin head, just something to hold it up like this. I'm using quilt batting to kind of flesh out the neck a little bit because I want the neck to be a little bit more poofy and not so skin tight so that this can be a pullover hood rather than a zip up. This is totally optional. If you want yours to be magnetic clasp or zip up, you can always just skip the quilt batting, but I like my hoods to be pullovers. I just find that it makes them a lot more breathable. Wrap the whole thing with saran wrap. And the whole reason why we do the saran wrap is because it will not only protect the paint, just because it is very easily peeled off if you're using something like I am here for duct tape to make my pattern, but it also makes it easy to remove the tape when you go to actually make your fabric pattern for this hood. I got a lot of people on my TikTok that asked me, you know, how did you do Vega's hood? How did you do this hood? And this is pretty much how it was done. Just template out, make sure the saran wrap is coated on there. You'll notice there's like a big bulbous part on the forehead. That is entirely my aesthetic decision to put that there because I wanted the feather plumage that I'm going to add later to look a lot more poofy and give it the illusion that the feathers are thicker than they actually are. So by adding a slight foam pad on top, I can pull off that illusion relatively good. Plus it also gives it a much more raptor-esque head shape, which I really liked how that came out. But again, totally and completely optional. It is not required. Continue placing the strips of tape onto the mask making sure that you're using smaller increments as you go. You will also notice that I've only taped up half of the head. This was done 100% intentionally as my patterns are most times symmetrical. So I'm able to just simply flip it and then have a two part pattern. That way I don't have to waste my tape or my time doing the whole head. I can just take half and then make it nice and symmetrical. As I traced along the edges, I made sure to note where certain places needed to come in to hide the mask and blend that transition much more smoothly. I also marked down the center of the back of the head just to be sure that that was going to be completely symmetrical. It does look kind of goofy when it sits on the mannequin head right now, but once it's all done, it makes a lot more sense. You'll also notice that I draw little arrows in each of these markings. These arrows are to note the direction of the fur. An important rule of thumb is whenever you're adding fur or any sort of material that has fibers that go one specific way, try to do so with all of the fibers facing away from the head. In nature, fur or most times scales or any sort of organic material will flow away from the face. This makes the animal more streamlined and thus is more commonly seen in nature. You should never have fur point towards the face unless you're intentionally doing so to create a specific effect. Once your pattern is all completely drawn on and you've got all your markings listed for what color and direction they are, you can go ahead and start cutting everything off of the mannequin head. Make sure that you're being very careful not to actually puncture the mannequin itself or scratch your mask. You'll also notice that when I made my template, I did so with the mask's mouth open. This makes sure that I have plenty of room for the fur to go onto the face. I highly recommend doing it this way. Once your template is free from the mannequin, it's now time to cut out all the individual pieces as well as cut the fabric darts. When you have pieces that are very round, you may have to make a small indent into them so that you're able to lay them flat. This does take some practice, and especially with this head because of the big bulbous forehead that I added, I had to split my pieces into many, many more pieces than I usually do. 
Make sure you mark each piece and where they connect to each other to avoid confusion in the future. I definitely learned this the hard way. <laughs> Whoopsie daisies. Cut out each piece until they're all free and everything lays mostly flat. Now the next part of this I'm actually going to be doing in a part two. If you enjoyed watching this, I thank you so much for taking the time to check it out. As stated, there will be a part two to this video, so be sure and look for that as soon as it releases. I try to edit the footage together as quickly as I can, but working on this project took me about a week and I have almost 18 hours of footage to cut through. So it's a lot of editing and with my job, I don't have a whole lot of time. I'm gonna do the best I can so that you guys can get all this lovely content and you can see how I made this beautiful raptor mask. You should see how it comes out in the end. She really came out cool. But as always, I do wanna thank you all so very much for taking the time to watch my videos. I really appreciate the support and especially those who have decided to help support me even further by donating to my Patreon. You can check it out if you'd like. Even donating $1 a month will get you on this screen you see here. But there are two individuals especially that I really have to go out and above to thank. Osmium Dragon and Draxfur. These two wonderful people have been sitting at the silver tier and just doing phenomenal things to support me, both encouraging me with words as well as supporting me financially. Thank you guys so very much. I really appreciate it. If you would like to consider joining my Patreon, check out the link on screen or click down in the description. I would greatly appreciate it if you take a look. I'll still keep releasing videos as always, just so that you guys can enjoy all this lovely content. Thank you so very much for watching, and as always, I hope you have a most wonderful day and a fantastic life.